الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما بعثت لأتمم مكارم الأخلاق صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ونبينا محمد مبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا at this time, I would just like to introduce the topic of this program, which is about akhlaq, morality. It is a very lengthy and very deep topic because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, I have been sent to perfect the good manners. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this deen اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي I have perfected this deen and I have given you this complete نعمة أتممت عليكم نعمتي the نعمة of Islam had been completed at that time which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sealed put a final seal on this iman on this Islam that this is the final and this is complete way of life. There is no need to bring more religions into this. There is no need to borrow teachings from other religions in order to be able to follow this religion. This religion by itself is already perfect and complete. Same way, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith about morality, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ The purpose of me coming to this world is that I perfect and complete the good manners, which simply now would mean that in order for us or for any person to follow the good behavior and to learn the good akhlaq, good manners, it's enough for us to learn the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We do not have to borrow any, anything about this field of life from anywhere else. Or in simple words, you can even make it more stronger by saying that you can challenge the world that whatever is taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about akhlaq, no one can bring a better teaching than that in the world till the day of Qiyamah, because that thing has been sealed, has been perfected, has been completed. This is a very important statement that Rasulullah made about this topic. That in the Mabu'ist, I have been sent only to perfect the good manners. <coughs> See the word Atmamta alaykum na'mati is used for Islam in Quran. And same way, لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ is used by Rasulullah The word Itmam is used for both. That perfect, completed, that's it. No more additions will be done to this, and no one can bring anything that can suggest that if you add this to this deen, this deen would become better. Same way no one can suggest anything that can say that if you add this to the list of good moralities and good behaviors, Islamic manners will, be, will look even better. Just like many times, people feel that if we can say this also about uh, on reference of our deen, people will look at it in a better way. 
There is nothing, there is nothing in the world that will make this deen better anymore. That's it. It's been completed, perfected, and is in its best form and shape as it should be. Same thing about akhlaq. So no one, and this is something very amazing that throughout the history we have people, and not only people, we have universities, departments that in universities that are devoted to this topic, that how human beings are supposed to behave, live, and deal with each other. And this deen of Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that, that no one can do anything better than, no one can bring any teaching better than the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding this field. If we start looking at religions, not to talk about bringing something better than the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, the amazing part would be, in other religions, the person has to decide whether he would like to be a very religious person, or he has to be, or he would like to be a very helpful person to the other people. If you are trying to be very helpful, which means live with people, help people in different fields of the life, financially, if a person is helping people financially, or if a person is physically supporting people, like he is out uh, helping the needy people, or he is taking care of the sick people, a physician who goes out and is treating people for free, in other religions, a person would have to decide whether he would like to be a very religious people, or he has to be a person with high morality characteristics and go out and help people. He cannot be both at the same time. You cannot be a very highly respected priest and at the same time being in this field uh, where you are out helping people. Because their concept of religion is that religion is the name of some worships and dogmas that are being performed only at the place of worship. When a person is sitting in his place of worship, whether you call it a uh, uh, church or a synagogue or whatever they may call it, when a person is sitting over there and offering the methods of prayer that, has, that are prescribed in the religion, that makes the person very religious. If a person does not put that gown on and he does not do the things that are prescribed to be done in the place of worship, then he is not considered to be a very high religious person. So in a person, in order for a person, just like this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran about, uh, especially about Christianity, This rahbaniya means they used to stay out in the jungles and doing the worship. That was the main concept behind it, that you cannot be with people, you cannot live with people and still at the same time be a very religious person. So in order for you to be a very religious person, you have to go out and just meditate and sit over there meditating for the whole of your life and don't have no connection with human beings. And that is part of it we see it in different form nowadays where in certain religion priests will not be allowed to marry. That's the same concept behind it. That if the person is going to get married, then he's involved in the worldly things. And the Sharia, this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beauty of it, that it's so beautiful, it's so complete, so perfect, that makes all of these things part of deen. So now, if a person thinks that a person who's having a nice gown on and is sitting in the place of worship, he's doing in the masjid, and he doesn't do anything other than just to keep on doing, he's sitting with his tasbih and subhanallah, subhanallah, throughout the day, and he's doing salah all the time, if our concept that this is the most religious person in the world, then really we have not understood our deen. Our deen, this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, considers our marriage part of, is, of, is part of our deen, is not part of dunya. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, al-nikahu min sunnati. Nikah is part of my sunnah. And in other hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, al-muslim, al-ladhi yukhalitu al-nas, wa yasbiru ala adahum, a Muslim who mixes with people and then when he faces hardships on the hands of others 
and he does not react to that, does not take revenge, does not uh, try to uh, hurt people back. This person is better than the person who's staying away from all the people and he does not mix with people. This is part of our deen. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that when you live together and when you deal with each other, this is, although there we may call it part of akhlaq, but this akhlaq is part of deen, it's not something that, is, that we can separate them from deen. A person who is trying to help the people that are in need in the community, the person who is trying to, uh, who, who goes out of the masjid in order to go and support someone, this is part of our deen, as Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was sitting in the masjid in Atikaf. A person came to him. He said, Ibn Abbas, I have some very important need that I think you can fulfill it. He said, what is that? He said, I took loan from a person and it's time for me to pay that person back. If you would just come with me and talk to the person about it, that because he respects you, so if you talk to him, he may give me some more time in order for me to pay it back because I'm not able to pay it back at this time. So Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu right away, he gets up and he starts walking with the person. So one of his students says, did you forget that you are an atikaf? Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu's response was, I know that I'm an atikaf, I did not forget. But I also heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that a person who is helping other people, a person who goes out to help another person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have seven ditches between this person and the hellfire and each ditch is as wide as this distance between the earth and the heaven. He says that this is better than atikaf. This is the reward of this will be greater than the atikaf and I'm seeking the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm going out to perform the deed that will get me a higher reward and get me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here we see that this akhlaq, morality, is part of our deen, is nothing that we can say, we can separate it from deen, that these people are very religious people, which means these people only do the ibadah, and these people are very helpful people to the community. For us to be religious, we have to be helpful too. Otherwise, a person who is just staying away is not really, if we look at the hadith, the other person who is fulfilling the requirement of his deen, and at the same time, he is being helpful, is better than the person who is just only in his ibadah and does not help others. This is something very clear in our deen. We know that the most virtuous person in this ummah, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And now, as Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu is considered to be a very virtuous person, at the same time, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his responsibilities were so much that he has to now take care of all the affairs of the ummah and especially sitting on that position where only some days ago Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting there. It was extremely difficult. We really cannot understand the position of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu as if we just look at the history from the point of view as how Sahaba are looking at him. See, a Sahaba, any of the Sahaba, they would not accept anything that would be different than the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if anything like that would happen, right away they would speak up. And here Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is sitting in that position and everyone is watching him. And no one wants someone to be sitting in that position at the position of Abu Bakr, at the position of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They don't like it. They don't want anyone to be sitting there. And this is why they're watching him very carefully. And they want to make sure that whatever he does is in accordance with the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But subhanallah, no one could find anything wrong throughout this khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam, they agreed upon this point that no one, no one would, was able to find anything from Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu that was against the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It wasn't an easy position for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Then, while his, if it was just sitting, just sitting in that position and just taking the 
uh, taking care of the normal affairs would still be easy. Now, there are so many other things that came up in the Ummah. Murtaddeen, that those people who turned away from Islam, taking care of those people, those people now who are rejecting to pay the zakah. And we know, I mean, at least uh, I'm sure most of us, we know this portion of the history, that how many fitnas came up at that time. So he has to deal with all of those people at the same time. With all of this, Umar radiallahu anhu says that during the khilaf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, there were some people that were totally handicapped in Medina Munawwara, and some elderly people, some blind people. So at night time, I used to go to those places, into their homes, to go and clean the house for them, and do whatever work I could do for them. And subhanAllah, who's doing, who's saying this? This is Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. He goes out to go and do all of that work for those people. For me, if I would wake up 3 o'clock in the morning, I would not think of doing anything other than my own tahajjud. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, if he's up 3 o'clock in the morning, he goes out to those homes to make sure that he takes care of the need of all of these people. But Umar radiallahu anhu says, I was so amazed and surprised to see that all of their work is being done before I go there. So he says, Every day I go there, I find that everything is done. Finally, he says, I decided one day that I'm going to spend the whole night sitting here watching who comes here. Because he couldn't figure out who would be coming before him and doing all of this work at the middle of the night. And he says, the day then I was sitting there, and there I see, in the middle of the night, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu comes there. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa. He comes there. And he goes from house to house. And he's doing all of that work in the house. And then he leaves. And before Salat al-Fajr, he is in the masjid as normal as he just woke up and came to the masjid. No one knows about it. So he says, when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu left that place, there was, I went to one of these houses, and there was an older lady sitting over there. I asked her, I said, who cleaned all of this for you? He says, I don't know. I don't know. There is a man, he comes every night, he cleans everything and he goes. But I don't know who that man is. He doesn't even let them know who this person is who comes, cleans everything and he leaves. Imagine the responsibilities he has on his shoulder. What must be going through his mind at that time when there are so many armies out there fighting different, at different levels and different places. And when there is always a fear of superpowers of the world attacking Medina Munawwara. And when he has to do his own ibadah, when he has to take care of all the situation of the affairs of the Sahaba Ridwanullah in Medina and around Medina, and wherever Islam had spread, he is assigning governors over there. With all of this, this person when he wakes up, of course the most I would think of, let me just make a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I can do nothing, Ya Allah, help me do this, do this. But with all of this, still he finds time to go and out and help those people. Why? Because this is what they learned from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this is part of our deen. This is part of being in this deen. This is not something that we can separate it from our deen. Imam Zain al-Abideen rahmatullahi alayhi. the grandson of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. After he passed away, only at that time they found out there, that there were more than 100 families in Medina Munawwara that were supported by him. He used to support more than 100 families in Medina Munawwara. And as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith that when you give the charity, give it in such a way that لا تعلم شماله ما تنفق يمينه That your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is giving out. Subhanallah, he was helping those families in such a way that no one, even his own wife, his own wife, she didn't know that he was supporting all of these families. He, she didn't know this. This is how he was doing it. And what was the method? Every night, he tells her 
then I have to go out for doing some of my work. This is in the middle of the night. He leaves the home. She knows that he, lives, he, he leaves home for some of his work. Whatever that work is, he never told her that. And what the work was? That he goes out, he carries all of the food on his shoulder, and then he starts putting it at the doorsteps of those homes that he supports. When they wake up in the morning, they don't know who have put it out there. When they wake up in the morning, they find all of that food sitting there. When they were washing his body, now how did the secret reveal? No one knew. And of course, those poor people wouldn't know who is the person supporting them because he goes in the middle of the night, he just puts the food over there, and he walks away. When they were washing his body, they saw a lot of bruises on his back, on his shoulders. So they started asking his family, what is this from? We don't know. Started investigating about it. And finally they find out that because he used to tie the food and there is rope that is going over across his shoulder, so these are the bruises from those ropes carrying all of that food every night on his shoulder, taking it from house to house. This is how they took the steam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the great people of the ummah, the well-respected people of the ummah. Those people that we consider very virtuous, and they really, through their amal, through their action, they told us what is virtuousness. That this akhlaq, this behavior, the way we treat others, the way we behave with others, all of this is, this is part of our deen. It's the, the, we can never separate these things from our deen. But of course, as our understanding of deen is getting very limited in every field of life, same way we see that our understanding of general idea of what Islam is, is getting very limited also. So now we also have limited Islam into certain way of dressing or sitting in the masjid and doing few ibadahs, we perform the five daily prayers. And accordingly we have divided this deen into two. Some people are considered to be religious people and some people are considered to be very nice and good human beings. Now if you really analyze this and say, this, is a very, this person is very nice, mashallah, but he doesn't pray. The other person, mashallah, very religious, but he doesn't help others. This is something that is very commonly used now in our culture. And is used even within the deen, we use it as a person is very religious, but you can't expect to go and ask him for any help. He won't do it. This man, he doesn't pray, but he is a very nice man. And because of this, a lot of time people have an objection, they have this question, that how come we see more immorality amongst Muslims than it is in non-Muslims? I'm sure you may have heard this objection also, or at least sometime it may have come into your mind, what's the reason? You go to any of the Muslim countries, you buy something from the store, most probably there will be some defect over there where the person would not even tell you about it. One of the merchants would tell us, and this is a fact, he says that you order something from a Muslim country, so you know if it says 20 pieces on a box, you may get 18. Order the same thing from a non-Muslim country, if it says 20 pieces, there may be 21 or 22 pieces, in case if some of them are damaged, then at least you have two extra. And this is an objection that, of course, it's a valid objection that comes to people's mind, but what's the reason behind it? The reason is that we started separating our deen from akhlaq. But then again the question would come, the other religions did the same thing then how come they are not following under the same category here? Why Muslims then are doing this and they are not doing it? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have answered this in a hadith. When Islam started spreading throughout Arabia, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time said to Sahaba radwanullahi alayhi wa jma'een, Inna shaytan qad ais an ya'budahu al-musalluna fi jazeerat al-arab. 
Shaitan has given every hope now that people will start worshipping him again, which means they would come back to idol worshipping. He has given every hope in that. He won't even try, he doesn't even want to try that. Now what Shaitan would like to do is Walakin Fittahrishi Bainahum. Now he would like people to just start fighting against each other. This is something that Shaitan expects from this Ummah that he spreads immorality amongst the Ummah. Because he knows attacking Iman is not that easy now. Iman of these people is very strong. So if a shaitan, if a thought would come to a person that I should just leave the deen billah and I should just not worry about religion anymore, right away the person says, no, no, at least I'm a Muslim. At least I'm a believer. I believe in Allah. I believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even if he doesn't perform no salah, nothing, but at least that iman is there in the heart. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that because of this iman, shaitan knows that it's difficult now to attack these people's iman. So what shaitan has chosen now with this ummah, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is already warning us about it, that now he would attack our akhlaq. That spread immorality amongst the ummah. And then he would be satisfied with that. Shaitan would be satisfied with it. So now with the other people, he knows that the person doesn't have no iman. When the person doesn't have no iman, he would like that person to be very good in morality. Why? So that he's satisfied with whatever he's doing. You know, I'm doing very good. I'm being nice. And I never lie. I don't cheat. Why do I need Islam for? So now if you go and present Islam to someone telling them that, you know, Islam will teach you not to cheat, not to lie, not to do this, not to do that. The person says, I'm already into this and I'm already very good with this. So why do I need your religion for? Shaitan keeps those people up to these levels so that they are satisfied with whatever they are doing and they don't look into becoming better people. This is why a lot of time people say that uh, how come Islam is being accepted by people that are whatever that is, but the people that are considered to be criminals, low class people, because these are the people who they were not, they themselves were not satisfied with their lives. So now they thought of going, looking for something, and when they looked out for something, they realized that this deen is for them. And they can benefit from this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But certain level class of people who feel that, no, we are doing very well with our life. Everything we are doing is good, and we don't hurt others, and we don't harm people, we don't lie, we don't teach you sheep, we don't uh, break promises, we help people. In fact, we give so much donations, even non-Muslims, non -Muslims, giving so much donations, helping people, going out and uh, taking care of needs of others. So now the person is very satisfied with what he's doing, and he's not looking to become any better, and he would not even look into religions anymore because he feels what I have is enough for me. But when a person has iman, now, shaitan would like this person to do something by which at least for some time he would go to Jahannam. So what to do? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that he chose to, bring, to spread this immorality in the ummah so that at least through this he will know that he, can, he makes sure that he takes them to the other side for some time. Which means, shaitan, even shaitan knows that the thing that comes after iman in this deen, the thing that comes after iman is akhlaq. So when he knows that he cannot attack our iman, so he chose to attack our akhlaq. <laughs> make people cheat, make people lie, make people do all the wrong to each other. Now, a person is doing good things, but it's only out in public. To show people. In reality, this is not what this person is. This is not his life. This is what, not what this, person, uh, per, uh, this, the, the, this person's personality is. He is not like this. A person who comes, mashallah, we see him very nice in the masjid, and his wife is always complaining about him. Children are always complaining. There are people that you find, really, I mean, children, wife and children, they wish that he wouldn't come home. They don't want to see his face. They don't want to see him coming home. Because he's a burden in that house. He's a problem in that house. An outside world, Everyone looks at the person, mashallah, such a nice brother. The problem is, he did not learn the akhlaq of the nabuwa from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, 
generally speaking, when, when we say about people, Muslims or non-Muslims, this is very general nowadays. When we say about people, this person, mashallah, is very nice. He is very nice. And then a lot of time, really, our people will also have this question and this objection in their mind that how come, look, these people, they are so nice with akhlaq. What makes them be so nice? Remember one point. When we think that this is morality, in reality, what that person is doing is not a morality. I'll tell you why. There is a reason. I would like to be very nice to you. I like to be very nice to my neighbors. Why? So that they would leave me alone, they won't hurt me. I don't hurt you, you don't hurt me. I don't disturb you, you don't disturb me. I'm being nice so that you be nice to me. That is the main reason why people like to be nice. See, after when the situations change in this part of the world, now we, when we go out, we smile to people. Why? Because we like them to be nice to us. <laughs> in, our, in, the, uh, in reality, the person's personality is that there's not a person who would smile. You, would get, you get surprised, oh, he's smiling today. <laughs> But the reason he's smiling is not because this is his personality. The reason, the only reason he's smiling is because he likes to protect himself. It's a personal protection. I leave you alone, you leave me alone. And this is what we are trying to tell the people today. Believe me, if you look at our message out there today, I shouldn't say it, but if I won't say it, then I don't know, I don't expect non-Muslims to come and tell us this. But this is a reality, this is what we have been telling people, we are very nice people. Don't hurt us. We are good citizens. And you see that we are always being so nice, so helpful to you. So why, why, why are you after us? SubhanAllah, this is, now we are trying to prove that, you know, I'm a good man, you know, please, you know, so don't hurt me. I, there was a story a king had a person working for him and he was very close to this king. So this man, his habit was, anything happens, he says, MashaAllah, this is good, this is from Allah. So one day, the king cut his finger. This person says, MashaAllah, this is good, this is from Allah. And says, I cut my finger and you say, MashaAllah, and it's good, you're fired. So he fires him. The person says, as he's fired, he says, MashaAllah, this is good, this is from Allah. The king is even more upset. But what can he do? He's already fired him now. He did everything he could. The person goes back home. A few days later, the king goes out for hunting. He gets lost in the jungle. And there, he's approached by some robbers. They take him away. And they tell him that, look, this is our territory. And our rule over here is, anyone comes over here, we kill him. And he begs them, please, don't do this. Says, no. That's, you can't go out alive from here. This is our rule, that whoever comes over here, we just kill him. That's it. Robbers have their own rules. They have their territories. No other robbers can enter into that territory and rob people. No, this is my territory. I'm the one who will do this here. This reminds me of something that Imam Najozi rahmatullahi alayhi have narrated also. That once a person, a person says that I was out and I love that, that story, inshallah, if you remind me then I'll come, we'll go back to that one. A person ends up being in the jungle and is approached by a robber who says that my rule is, whenever a person comes over here, I take everything from him, including his clothing. So here, put everything here and go. So this person says, you know, please, just give me my clothing. When I go back, I'll send it back to you. <laughs> he says, no, I'm not going to do that. So he says, I know you don't trust me that I will send it or I'll bring it, 
So if you want, you can come with me. And as I get home, I'm going to change and give you my clothing. So he says, no, this is not happening because I know you'll get your helpers and everyone. You're going to call the police on me. And no, that's not happening. So he keeps on begging him and begging him. And finally, this man himself suggests that how about this, that, you know, I take oath by Allah that if I do anything to harm you and I don't give you the clothing, I don't give you what you ask for, then my wife is divorced. And what you need more than this, of course, I'm not going to divorce my wife or let my wife go for these things. So please, now, now you know that I'm not lying at you and I'll give it to you. So when he says so much, the robber starts thinking about it. And after thinking for a short while, he says, oh, you know what, I'm sorry, I can't do it. He says, why? He says, because I was thinking about all the robbers from the time of Prophet wasallam up to this day, did anyone rob people under these promises? And I found that no robber have ever done anything like this. So if I would do it, this would be a bid'ah. <laughs> And nowadays we hear this word a lot. That if you do it this way, then it becomes bid'ah. So this robber says, you know, if I would rob under this promise that you go and bring it back to me or I come and pick it up from you, you know, this will be a bid'ah, this is why I can't do it. So that robber says to the king, you know, this is my territory and uh, you can't go alive. So he says, no, you know, I'm the king and I'll do this for you, do that for you. He says, oh, if you're a king, then you're even a better person for us, you know. The greater person that we kill over here, the better we feel that, you know, I did a better sacrifice. So, he has no choice anyway. Finally, they, when they were about to kill him, they saw his finger was cut. Oh, you have something wrong with your finger. Yeah, I cut my finger. No, we don't kill people who have any defect in their body. You can go. This is just like the same lamb for, for slaughtering, that you have to see that no, no defect in this animal. So they said, you know, you have some defect on your body, we don't kill people like that, go back home. So he goes back home and now he's so happy with his, that man who says, you know, this is good. That person who worked for him, told him this is good, this is from Allah. So he, right away he goes home and he calls that person, he says, call him. He comes, he says, you know what happened, he tells him the whole story. So he says, MashaAllah, see, it was so good, but it wasn't good only for you, it was good for me too. So he says, why? He says, had you not cut your finger, you would not fire me. And if you would not fire me, I would have been with you in the jungle, and I have no defect on my body, they would have killed me. So this is good for, this is from Allah. So, all of this is, I mean, the point that we are talking about here is that akhlaq, these teachings are part of our deen. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches us that these things are such that we cannot separate them from our deen. They are part of our deen. We see Khulafa'ul Rashidin, we see the great people in the ummah. They spend a good time of their life in this field, which means in akhlaq in helping others, in being, in, in their behaviors. When people, I was talking about, when people are following the akhlaq, when people, we say that this person is, mashallah, is being very nice. This person is nice only so that he can be called nice person, he can be considered to be very nice by the whole neighborhood, by his colleagues, by the workers, and this is why he is nice. This person is nice because he would like to get some protection for himself. That's the only reason why he is being nice. And if this person would know that in this case, I don't need this man. This person is too poor. This person is too weak. I don't need this man. Now see how he behaves with this man. And it's very clear, we see that our attitude, how we behave with people that are considered to be some high class people, people from some countries that we feel that they, sh they are respectable or a person would come from a place where we feel that, that this person can do nothing. He is not of any help for me, he cannot hurt me, he cannot do anything for me and we look down at those people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's akhlaq was that whoever came, regardless where the person comes from, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treated them equally. 
And here we see that Bilal radiallahu anhu, who was always looked down at by all the people, by all the Arabs, and especially the Quraysh, the non-Muslims, who were uh, who always saw him as a slave in Makkah Mukarramah, and they were torturing him in Makkah Mukarramah. Finally, when Makkah Mukarramah was conquered, and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to Bilal radiallahu anhu that today you climb the Kaaba, go on top of the Kaaba and call the adhan. Some of the leaders of Quraysh that were sitting there, they started talking to each other. They said, today I feel that it was good for Abu Jahl that he died before this day. That he, would, he was not alive to see Bilal standing up there and calling the adhan. This is how insulted they were by Bilal's adhan. And I'm sure Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa chose Bilal especially for that purpose. To show them that in Islam, there is no difference. After a person comes into this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there is no difference. And another thing is, he was rewarding Bilal radiallahu anhu for another thing that was very important. This Bilal was always calling Ahadun Ahad. Ahadun Ahad. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose him to keep on calling that throughout his life. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So, that, that is the real akhlaq. When a person is doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then this deen, the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us that it has to be part of our life. It's not that I'm trying just to be like that. I'm showing you that this is what I am, but I'm not that. One of the description of Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhi as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, that aqalluhum takallufan. These Sahaba Ridwan Allah alayhi quality was that they were so simple. Their life was so simple that they were not trying to just make up things, to pretend that I'm this. I'm a good scholar so because I'm, now I, I'm addressing like this. They were not pretending. They were only what they were. They were doing what they are. This is why a Sahabi is performing Salah in a large group of people. He doesn't feel that I'm having any riya because he knows I don't make up and other people know about each other that no one in this community is just trying to show off with things. Everyone is just very simple and does only whatever he wants to do. If a person doesn't feel like praying, he's not going to pray. He's not going to pray just to show others that I'm praying. If a person doesn't have the money to invite others, he's not going to go and just borrow money from others and invite and have a big wedding ceremony so that people would know, mashallah, he's a great man. There was no tikalluf in that community. You know, they're, they're not trying to pretend be, being something that they are not. They're very simple people. And this is why their hearts were always clean and pure. That simplicity, they kept their hearts always clean and pure. That they are not thinking about that what people would think about me. If I do it this way, then people would be upset. Their main concern is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, when a person is doing everything with that in mind, when a person would do everything with this in mind, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me, then of course he would behave the best with everyone. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-Khalqa kulluhum Allah. All the creatures are depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah. They, they depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the dearest person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his creatures are those who are very helpful to others. Ahabbu al-Khalqa ilallah, anfa'uhum li'ayali. Those who are the most beneficial to other people and other living beings, they are the dearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This really leads us to another very lengthy topic, but I'm going to make it very brief and just mention it since it came to my mind at this little time. And that is, when we talk about benefiting others, remember, fulfilling the needs of all the living beings, in reality, if you look at it, it is the responsibility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where He says, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا That Allah says, it is my responsibility to provide all the human beings with their risk and give them whatever they need. Which means necessities of the life. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it upon Himself. There are certain things where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is my responsibility. For example, protection of Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is my responsibility. 
I would protect this Quran. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was alive. Protection of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Quran, in Quran Allah announces that it is my responsibility, I would protect my Prophet. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about anything that this is his responsibility, that simply means this thing is going to happen no matter what. This is how it's going to happen. Quran will be protected till the day of Qiyamah. We see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was protected until he passed away. No one was able to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or anything like this. Same thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, risk is my responsibility. No one can close the doors of the risk to this, to this world. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will close his, if he closed, closed the doors of risk, that, of course, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like the time when he would decide to take the Qur'an away from the world, then that will be his choice. But human beings will not be able to change this Qur'an or take it away from people. Human beings were not able to do anything to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that he would this time, now it's time for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to leave, then he took Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he decides to close the door of the rizq, no one can open it. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors of the rizq, then this, the human beings in this world will keep on getting the rizq for sure. And amazing that we see so much of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creatures, all kind of animals in the world. We just look at ourselves, but look at the animal, different type of animals in the world, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing risk for all of them. How many of these animals are eating every day? Subhanallah, when we have a small zoo, we bring few animals from here and there, and then we make a zoo, and then right away you start hearing the huge figures that we are spending these many millions of dollars every year on the zoo. And in the jungles, there are so many, there are so many animals, uncountable. We get two lions and we can't feed them. And the jungle is full of them, lions, elephants, all of these animals. And, Umam in Dabbat in Filardi, illa ala Allahi rizquha, you really see how they all are getting the rest. And no complaint that there, there is shortage of food over there. The complaint is only from human beings. And this complaint also started when human beings started thinking that we are the ones who control it. So then we started controlling the means of risk for others. No one is allowed to fish. <coughs> fishing is not allowed. Why? If all of you go fishing, then you'll take all the fish out of the oceans and the ocean will be out of fish. Then human beings, next generation, won't be able to eat fish. So people are afraid that we would finish all the fish from the ocean. If this was true, the oceans around Bangladesh, they would have been out of fish. <laughs> but they still have all the fish in the world and Alhamdulillah, today, this day they are eating it and they are eating more than anyone else. And up to this day they are eating it. And no restrictions. It's a fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider. He knows how to provide. And all of this is in His control. So as much as we consume, accordingly he gives more production. And accordingly he gives, keep on giving us more and more. Just like some of the scholars have given this example, that in the days when they used to use camels and horses as a ride, there were so many camels and horses in the world. And now as people did not depend on those, and we started having different type of rides, we don't see these many camels and horses. It is all under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's control and He fulfills our needs in different ways. So the point that I was mentioning, there are certain things where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is solely my responsibility, I would do it. But of course, He does not come Himself to do it like physically, we don't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing it. He uses human beings for that. So he uses human being, he used Sahaba Ridwanullahi Ali Majma'een for protecting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He uses human beings for protecting the Qur'an. He uses human beings for protecting the deen. Same way he uses human beings for fulfilling the needs of other. All of these are things that he said, this is my responsibility, but human beings will be used for doing this. Now, when we are being used, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Qur'an says that human beings are Khalifatullah. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ 
إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to angels that I'm creating a, a creature that will be considered my khalifa. What does khalifa mean? Khalifa means a successor. When a person is not there, someone who would do the work on your behalf or do the work that you were supposed to do and he would sit in your position and keep on doing all of that work for you, that person is khalifa. I'm leaving town. The Imam is leaving town, he assigns someone in his behalf, on his behalf, that person is considered to be his Khalifa. That he, this person is Khalifa on this Imam now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about human beings, that human being is my Khalifa in the world. Which simply means that the things about which I say that I would do them, I would use human beings to fulfill those needs. I would use human beings to protect my, my Quran, my book. I would use human beings to fulfill the needs of others. Now those human beings who are being used, who are being used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or a better word maybe, who are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do the work that are Allah's responsibility, that He says my responsibility, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us to do that work in this world that is a great honor for us. It is a great honor for us that we get into that position where we are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do the work and the type of work about which Allah says that it is my work and my responsibility to do this. When we are helping others, when we are fulfilling the needs of others, this is something that Allah says, it's my responsibility. When we are doing it, this is an honor for us. We are not really... Or that person that uh, uh, the one that we are helping he is not the one that really f would should feel that this person is doing a great favor to me in fact we that person is doing great favor to us by accepting our help because by that he is giving us the opportunity of being in that position where we are fulfilling the responsibility of khilafa of being khalifatullah on this earth this is how we fulfill this responsibility of ours. And this is how we get into that position. So the more we are helpful to others, the more we are getting into that situation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using us for this khniyaba, for this khilafa on this earth. And this is why we see Anbiya alayhimu salatu wassalam are the most helpful in this world. With all the other responsibilities they have, they are very helpful. For example, when we look at the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and this is only one way, one way of helping others, that you keep on spending and give everything out. And you look at the generosity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanAllah, it's amazing that he doesn't want to keep anything at his home. Whatever he has, he gives it out. Everything he has, he gives it out. Sometime a question may come to our mind that, we read about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that sometime for days he would not have food. And then on the other hand you read that there are sahaba who are very close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they are very, alhamdulillah, very well to do. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, that is Usman radiallahu anhu, his Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, son-in-law. And Talha radiyallahu anhu, there are many other sahaba, Zubair ibn al-Awam radiyallahu anhu, these sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa they have so much wealth, how come they are sitting on, of this, on all of this wealth and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has nothing to eat, why, they don't, why don't they go and offer some, some few dates to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? But the point was, these sahaba have tried it too. They would go and give it and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is still hungry because he gave it to someone else. The next Sahabi goes and he gives it, and he gives it to another person. It was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's rule of the life. As long as he knows someone is in need of the food that he has, he will not touch it, he will give it out to those people. If he knows any person that can use it, that can have, that has any need for it, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would not use it himself, he would go out and give it to that person. Um Salama radiallahu anha says, One day we got some meat, and very rarely they used to have meat. We got some meat as a gift. I saved it for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A person came and knocked at the door asking for food. I said to that person that I'm not able to help you today. 
when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, very happily I offered that meat to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But as I put it in front of him, he asked me, Um Salama, what is this? Meat, Ya Rasulullah. No. Look at it. It was a piece of rock. It was a piece of rock. And she was so surprised. Ya Rasulullah, I swear, I put, the, I, I, I put a meat over there. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew what the situation was. He asked her, did anyone come to ask for food? Yes, Ya Rasulullah, a person came. And I told him that I cannot help today. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that's the, that's the reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow me to eat if it was not given to a needy person. This was his life. He would not use it. So it's not that there is no money over there. It's not there is no food. But whatever you offer it to me, gives it to someone else. A person says that once, initially he says in the beginning days when I came to Medina Munawwara, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept me in his house as his own guest. And he told me that we get a glass of milk every day, so we'll share it half and half every night. Before you go to bed, you take half and I will take half. He says, one day after Salat al-Isha, when I went home, I drank half of my milk, and then I kept the other half for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't come. And I was waiting for him, waiting, waiting. He didn't come in. After a long wait, I thought, you know, he must, been in, must have been invited somewhere today. So I went and I drank the other, part of, the other half of the milk. And then I went to sleep. He says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a little later he came home, and he went straight to that glass of milk. He picks it to see it's, it's empty. There is no milk in there. And this Sahabi says that it was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's habit that when he would enter the home, he used to say salam in such a voice that if we are sleeping, we would not wake up. And if we are awake, we would hear it. Today, a person enters the masjid, and you hear, you feel like there is azan going on. <laughs> this is how loud people say the salam. That you feel that second or third azan is standing now. This is against the other. People are, if people are in their ibadah, they are doing salah, they are in their adhkar, they are doing dua, and a person goes and shouts with salam. Everyone in the masjid is disturbed. This is not the good adab. I mean, Sometimes we feel that, see I, how good I am, you know, I said salam so loud. <laughs> we need to learn the adab of Islam. These are things that we really need to learn only from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he would enter home and say salam in such a way that if people are awake, they would hear him, and if they are sleeping, they would not be disturbed by his salam. So he said he said salam in that way, then he went and he looked for the milk, it wasn't there. This Sahabi says, I wasn't, I wasn't sleeping, I was watching, but I pretended that I'm sleeping now. I can't face him. And that milk was from a goat that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had. He used to tie it out of the house. So the goat was tied out of the house, and we would milk it every day and drink the milk uh, at night. He says, now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he found that the milk is finished, and there is not, nothing for him to eat, so he raised his hands for dua. This Sahabi says, I was so scared <laughs> that I'm done today. He's going to make dua against me that, Ya Allah, whoever drank my milk, do this to him, do this to him. And this is normally our position. But he said, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making the dua. Allahumma ta'imman ta'amani. Ya Allah, who feeds, whoever feeds me, feed him. Ya Allah, whoever provides me with drink, provide him with the drink. And he started making dua for anyone that would do anything for him. This Sahabi says, I heard that beautiful dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now I'm thinking to myself, I would like to be in that position of I getting the dua, but I have nothing, I've finished all the milk and I don't have nothing to offer him. But still he gets up, he goes out, and he kills the goat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <laughs> and... He says to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I'm bringing in the meat right now. 
and he starts preparing it and he brings the meal and offers it to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ate from that meal and asked him, where did you get this from? <laughs> ya Rasulullah, this is your own goat that was out there, I sacrificed it, I killed it and uh, offered you the food. Why did you do this for? I heard you making that beautiful dua that Ya Allah feed the one who feeds me, provide drink to the one who would provide me with drink. So I thought, you know, I would like to get your dua. So I said, you know, I'll give it to you and then uh, at least I get your dua. Imagine after this, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiles to him and he makes more dua for him. That was the only source of food for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He takes it, he kills it, and still he gets more dua from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where are we going to get these akhlaq from? So when we say the world is having akhlaq, people are practicing akhlaq and they are being very nice, we don't know what is being nice means. Go and just do something, put a little scratch on his car and you will find out how nice the man is. <laughs> really, I mean, he is, and here this person takes the, all the source of his food and still he gets more dua and gets a smile from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, akhlaq, what really akhlaq is, that's only we learn it if we go through the hadith and study the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the real akhlaq. There is no akhlaq. So from that angle, when really a person would study the hadith about akhlaq and the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when after that, if you look around, you see no akhlaq. Really, you see no akhlaq then. But if without it, closing your eyes from what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was, then yes, there are a lot of nice people. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he is sick. He felt like eating some fish. They hardly used to get fish in Medina Munawwara because it's away from the seashore. So, and you know sometimes when the person is sick, he feels like eating something. So, he felt like eating some fish. He tells his family, you know, I feel like eating fish. So especially when a person is sick, you go out of your way to try to give the person what he likes to have. So the family really did a lot of arrangement to send someone out of Medina, traveled for three days, go and bring the fish. When, they brought the, when uh, that person brought the fish and they prepared it for him, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu knew that today they had got the fish and they prepared it for me. He's coming back from Salat al-Zuhr and he sees a person who was insane. The saliva is dripping, is dripping from his mouth and children are just uh, running behind him and they're disturbing him, troubling him. And this man is just running here and there. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu grabs this person's hand and he takes him home. Then he makes him sit with him. With his own hands, he's feeding that person the fish. Until he gave him the whole, all the fish that was there, he fed him that fish. So his wife was extremely upset. Everyone in the family was very upset that we worked so hard to get this fish, to prepare it for you, and because you were sick, you felt like eating it, so we brought it for you. Here you are feeding this man. There are so many other items. If you wanted, you could have fed this man something else. And he won't even know it. To this man, it makes no difference. He's insane. You feed him anything. He doesn't care. So you could have fed him something else if you really wanted to feed this man today. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said, I wasn't feeding this man because who he is. I was feeding him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah knows which item I like the most. And I'm doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so therefore I have to do the best for Allah. This is for Allah, not for this man. Akhlaq. Only when we look at the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how Sahaba Ridwan Allah learned these akhlaq from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then only the person can have some understanding of what morality is, what akhlaq are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the right understanding of akhlaq, of the akhlaq of the nabuwa, that what are the akhlaq of the nabuwa, the uh, teachings of the nabuwa regarding this field and give us tawfiq to follow it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us, the true followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the very important things, of course, time is over long ago, but one of the very important points that we forget about akhlaq is that normally our akhlaq is that behavior only with each other. But Anbiya alayhi salatu wassalam taught us that akhlaq are not limited just our behavior to each other, even our behavior with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That how we behave with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we are being nice to each other, 
Just because you did a favor to me, I say Jazakallah. I say, I say, I come and say thank you. But days and days go by. We are receiving millions of favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not once that we say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen from the bottom of our heart. Even when we are saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we don't even know what we have said. We say so many times in Salah and we don't even know what we have said. Today, by mistake, you push someone. Right away you'll tell them, sorry. Why? I'm a very nice person. It's only because of this, nothing else other than that. It's not my personality being very nice. It's not that because I'm on a higher level of akhlaq, I just come and say sorry so that you feel that this is not a rude person. How many times we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a day? And how many times we say sorry, Ya Allah, astaghfirullah, forgive me. Ya Allah, this was wrong on my behalf. Ya Allah, please forgive me. Astaghfirullah. We say sorry to human beings like us. We don't say sorry to Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala even after doing so much wrong. Where is akhlaq? And you take it in every field of life. I remember once, it was in New Jersey. A person was showing us his home. And he built a new house. He was showing me, mashallah, very nice home. And after he showed me everything and he I admired his house and everything. I said to him, you know, the front lawn that you have, you should have, take this lawn out and put some solid concrete over here. Take the lawn out, take the grass out and just keep some concrete over here. So he said, no, 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 it won't look good. I said, no, don't worry about it. It will look good. Just take the lawn out, take the grass out and just put a concrete slab over here. So he says, no, it's not even allowed. They, they won't even allow me to do this. The city doesn't allow I said, you know, this is how you behave with human beings like you. Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala told you that there is a lawn on your face. And you made it a concrete slab up there. <laughs> our behavior with Allah, our behavior with human beings. Two different things that we are taking it. Anbiya alayhi salatu was salam are teaching us that our akhlaq need to be part of our life where a person would really feel that this is what I'm supposed to do, this is how I'm dealing with human beings, this is how I'm going to deal with Rabbul Alameen subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to Salat al-Mustaqeem. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-Muslimin wa al-Muslimat wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.